Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to be with you this evening. Um, so I will do a, a short presentation, uh, introduction about Takeda and the change that we are making. I don't have any slides, actually. Just I will just uh, explain to you what we are doing at Takeda. And then I hope that we'll have a good interaction and plenty of questions uh, afterwards. So as mentioned, I, I joined Takeda 18 months ago now, after a long career at uh, GlaxoSmithKline. And um, I, for, often I, I am asked, why did you join Takeda? And, uh, and uh, it's true that it has been a big step for, for me after so many years in uh, the same company. You feel very comfortable in this company. You know everybody. You are in your network. But I couldn't resist to join such a company as Takeda with such a long history, uh, 234 years old company, one of the uh, oldest pharmaceutical companies in the world. I couldn't resist to join and take the challenge to transform this company to uh, make it a global leader and a successful leader in the next 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. So, uh, and it's, it's really, for me, important to have this type of uh, perspectives when you run uh, such a company. Uh, I am a little part of the history and the future of, uh, of the company. But yet, we are at a turning point and a very important moment at, uh, at Takeda for the future. So it's a, it's a very exciting, exciting time. Before, before I, I explain what we are doing and the transformation we are conducting, I just want to share with you uh, some um, elements of the pharmaceutical market. Many of you are not from the pharmaceutical uh, industry, pharmaceutical market, but I think, I think you will capture what, uh, what I will describe. 20 years ago, the Japanese market represented 20% of the global pharmaceutical market. So 20% of the global pharmaceutical market was Japan. Today, it's 8%. And in 10 years, it will be probably between 3 and 5%. So the, the global pharmaceutical market expanded a lot in the last 20 years, but mainly driven by emerging market. And in emerging market, it's entirely driven by population and access, economic development, and access to healthcare. And the pharmaceutical market has been entirely uh, driven also by the United States. Um, and that has been entirely driven by innovation. So in the last 20 years, the pharmaceutical market uh, grew very rapidly, in fact, uh, more than double in size, entirely driven by US innovation and emerging market access to healthcare and population. So 20 years ago, a big company like Takeda, when you had 10% of the Japanese market, you had 2% of the global market, and in a very fragmented market, actually 2% is quite big. Today, if you have 10% of the Japanese market, your market share globally is 0.8. And that's, that's much smaller. It's more than, than half. So that's one of the reasons why a, a, a company like Takeda, if to be successful in the future, has to be present, has to be a strong company in emerging market, in US, of course, of course, still in Japan. But this trend is very important to, uh, to have in mind. The second trend I will, I will uh, share with you regarding the pharmaceutical market is the cost of innovation. So Takeda is uh, and always has been a research-based company. So we invest in research. Today, we invest about 20% of our total sales in R&D. And our goal is to uh, treat new, um, is to discover new treatments for patients. And um, this, um, the hurdle for innovation has increased tremendously in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. Why that? For two reasons. One is that many diseases are quite well treated by molecules which have been discovered in the 70s, 80s, 90s. So if you take blood pressure, for example, 20 years ago, the first new effective treatment to uh, control blood pressure were discovered. Right now, you have a lot of treatment at the disposal of the doctors to treat blood pressure. And more than 80% of this treatment have generics, meaning very cheap product, 
which are quite good to treat blood pressure. So if you invest in R&D and you want to, to discover the new, the new treatment to control blood pressure, you need to be very significantly better than the existing treatment. If you are not significantly better than the existing treatment, you will not get reimbursement or you will not get a good price or you will not get both of them in many reimbursed countries where you have to negotiate your price with government. So the, the hurdle for innovation has increased very significantly, which means that the R&D budget have expanded uh, enormously in the last 10 years. Now, the only way to pay back this R&D investment, and a company like Takeda is investing about 3,000 Oku yen, so three, close to 3 billion US dollars per year in research, the only way to pay back this research is actually to commercialize and to introduce your new treatment uh, everywhere in the world or is as, many, as many countries as possible uh, in the world. So that's, that's the two trends that I wanted to, uh, to share with you. So looking in the future, uh, we, we still characterize or I characterize the future for the pharmaceutical industry as bright. Of course, if you, if you are good enough, I'll come back to that. But why, why bright? Why is it is an, uh, an important sector? And you know, I'm also, if some of you want to join the sector, I think that could be uh, interesting for you. One, because first, there is still an enormous healthcare need in emerging countries. When you think about it, the, uh, the pharmaceutical market, 30% uh, of the pharmaceutical market is the emerging market today, uh, a bit more than 30%. But yet, six billion out of the seven billion people on the planet are in emerging market. The United States, which has about 350 million inhabitants, represents half of the global pharmaceutical market. So there is still an enormous need for healthcare in emerging market, and that will continue to grow because long term, the economy will continue to grow in emerging market. The second element of optimism is that the, the, uh, the level of innovation that the pharmaceutical industry is able to bring uh, is extremely dynamic at the moment. Why? Because more than 10 years ago now, the human genome was decrypted, was discovered, and that it took 10 years to understand the consequences of this discovery. And during these 10 years, the number of new targets on which a molecule can act on in the body has expanded dramatically. So we have a number of new targets now which is greater than ever before in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. And this is why you do see a lot of very strong innovation at the moment uh, in the pharmaceutical industry because of this uh, new target that we can really uh, go after and uh, uh, act upon. And that's open a new range of uh, possibilities in many diseases. So it's a very exciting time for the pharmaceutical industry. So how Takeda wants to, how Takeda wants to uh, play in this overall market and how will we become or will we stay a global leader? Because this is our intent as, as uh, a Japanese company. We want uh, to be a global Japanese company in the pharmaceutical market. We want to really be considered as one of the few companies in the world who is able to uh, understand all the different markets and come up with real innovation. So this is a, a strategy that uh, we, uh, we really um, crystallized uh, last year after a few months, uh, just to share with you uh, how, I, uh, um, uh, how I, I came to Takeda and it's always interesting, you know, one of the key moments when uh, you start a new job is, okay, what do you do in the first days, in the first hours, in the first weeks and months? In fact, I spend the first uh, almost four or five months meeting people in the company. Uh, I did a world tour and I met different teams. I did 50 focus group with employees. Um, middle managers, everywhere, R&D, manufacturing side, commercial side, to understand where we are good at, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, 
uh, what should we improve, and what sh should be our focus moving forward, what is the culture of the company as well, what type of DNA, I call that often the DNA of the company. And uh, that was a very important time for me to uh, understand how, what we could do, because it's good to have an aspiration for the future, but it's also important to understand how you can get there and how you can execute. So we progressively uh, define our strategy and our vision, and we call it our strategic roadmap. So this is our sort of highway or roadmap for the future. The first thing we define, and that's, very, that's the most important part actually for, for us, and we believe that it's, it's, it's a way to differentiate ourselves as well, but we truly believe into that, is that we define how we will conduct business. What are the rules, if you like, of the game for, for us? And uh, it might seem obvious to you, but I will take a few examples to illustrate. So the first thing is it's about our values, how we conduct our business, and here we, we, we we express it in four words, patient, trust, reputation, business. So that's how we conduct our activities in Takeda. First, we start for, with the patient. Do we do the right thing for the patient? So that's always our starting point. Then we look at trust. Is what we are doing reinforcing the trust between the company and the society? And for us, it's critical because we are in the, in the domain of health. We treat patients. And of, of course, it only works if there is trust between us and the physician, between us and the patient. So trust is, is, is critical. Then the third word, the third dimension, values, is reputation. Is what we are doing increasing our reputation in the mid, short term, mid term, long term? That's critical. We need to, for any topics, we need to answer yes to that on top of patient and trust. And then the fourth element, but the last one, is, is it good for our business? Is it developing our business? So every time we have a decision to take which is, which is difficult, this flow, patient, trust, reputation, business, is uh, helping us to make the right decision. It is very, very helpful uh, in, in, in many ways. Actually, the patient is the easiest because it's very obvious. I mean, don't hurt the patient. That's, so that's, that's, that's very clear. But trust, the reputation and business, that's, that's, um, that's more complicated. And this flow is very important to us. And Takeda has a very long history and a very strong, has very strong values of integrity and honesty. And we are building on that as well to, to, uh, to follow this, this principle of patient trust, reputation, business. And I'll give you an example. Uh, last week, we were very fortunate. We got a key approval in the United States for one of our key products last week. This product will treat patients with multiple myeloma. And we, last week, we decided the price, what should be the price, and more importantly, what should be our access strategy. Um, one of the key topics in terms of trust and reputation for the pharmaceutical industry is how do you provide guarantee access to your product in every country? So not only the rich and members country, but also the poor countries. How do you do that? And when we, decide, when we discussed about our pricing strategy, we, want, we, we discussed holistically about it. Not only about the US price or the Japanese price or the, the European price, so that's reimbursed, that's a negotiation with government, but also about price in low-income countries, price in countries where there is no reimbursement. People, people pay from, um, uh, from, from their, with their, their own money. And that, of course, requires a lot of agility and flexibility. And we were very adamant that this product, which is saving life, will be accessible to everyone. And that's what the company will be committed to in the future. And we are very confident to do that, and not many companies do that, because of this value-based um, uh, uh, philosophy that we have uh, really crystallized uh, regarding our strategy. So patient, trust, reputation, business. In our strategic roadmap, we have a, a second element, which is about people. It's about people, and here we have two dimensions when we talk about people. The patient, back to the patient, 
And we want to be a very customer-centric organization, very patient-centric. And ask me questions about that if you want later on. But we have designed specifically our organization in order to be as focused on the customer as possible. And so we believe that it will be a differentiating point for the future uh, because we want to really serve the, the customer and the patient. And the way we see the market, and that's not easy, and that's the case, I think, in many businesses, but probably even more in the pharmaceutical industry, we are dealing with global market, global product. So the product that we got approved last week, last Friday, will eventually be launched in 80 countries. Because there are multiple myeloma patients everywhere in the world. But the way the treatment is done, the reimbursement mechanism, the patient flow into the healthcare system is very local. It's very different. And we need to, the agility locally to respond to that. So the same product is in fact prescribed differently. The medical guidelines are still not global, they are local. In many countries, and that's always amazing me because people tend not to know it, but in many countries, you don't have access to some drugs, which are very good, but they don't exist in the countries where you are. So it changed the, the treatment paradigm. So we believe that we need this agility locally in order to respond to, uh, to that. The second element of our people focus is about our own, own employees. We want to focus a lot on development, talent development, um, not only locally, but also developing global talent. That's very important. Um, I was asked a few minutes ago, what, what is, uh, who is in my, my, my leadership team? So I have, today I have, um, a, we call it Takeda executive team, that's my team. There are, including me, we are 15. In this uh, group of 15, I have, I don't, I don't, nationality doesn't matter so much, frankly, but I think there are more, like, more than seven or eight nationalities. Uh, so it's a very global, very international team. And, um, and all of these team members have had global experience in different regions, in different countries. We believe that to run a global company is very important. It's actually critical. Personally, I've lived in nine countries um, so I've moved around. I was fortunate to have my family <laughs> accepting that. It's not easy, but it's, it's a very important element of, uh, of development to become a, a global leader when you are a company which operates in 80 countries like uh, Takeda does. So we will invest a lot on people development in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, leadership, training. Uh, we introduce, for example, uh, simple programs which exist in some companies, but not in every one, like a global induction program for people joining the company. We introduced a, a president forum during which I have the opportunity to meet our key talents. I mean, we have a lot of programs which we are introducing now. We believe that it's, it's critical for our success. Third element of our strategy is about R&D. It's about innovation. And that's a tricky one. Um, that's, the, that's the, the big challenge of the pharmaceutical industry. We spend 20% of our sales in R&D. We spend three billion US dollars per year. How do you get return on that? And that's a, that's a huge challenge, especially when, as I mentioned, the bar for innovation is raising all the time. So how do you, how, how do you uh, meet this challenge? And this is our only way to survive because as, as you probably know, we have on average about 10 years of commercial exclusivity. So uh, the patent, uh, patent life is 20 years, but you file your patent on average 10 years before you launch your product. Because it takes 10 years to develop, to prove that your product is good by doing uh, clinical trials. So basically, after you, you have 10 years of commercial exclusivity, and after 10 years, you get generic entry. So unless you are able to renew your portfolio all the time, you are, you, you are in trouble. So that, that's the biggest challenge of the pharmaceutical industry. Now, in order to, to, uh, to uh, meet this challenge, what we have decided to do is to focus on a few therapy areas or a few diseases 
which we believe we are good at and which we believe we can be a leader in this disease. And that's, that's a big choice. That's a big choice that uh, we made is to say, instead of searching everywhere in many, many areas, we need to focus on win in a few areas. So we have selected five areas. GI, gastroenterology, and Takeda has been in this field for many, many years. Oncology, but oncology is very vast. So within oncology, we have selected a few, uh, a few areas where we believe we are the, at the leading edge. Neuropsychiatry and cardiovascular. Plus, we have two candidates for vaccines. We have one vaccine against dengue and one vaccine in development against neurovirus. So we'll focus on these five therapy areas. Still quite a lot, but we believe that we have been very careful at, at choosing these areas. We believe that they are big enough for a company uh, the size of Takeda. They are small enough so that we can really win. And more importantly, we believe that we have the internal skills to be one of the leading companies in these areas. And that's very important. That's, uh, that's always very hard in our, in our, in our uh, activities is, and that's a question I always ask to our R&D uh, team when I meet them, is how do you rate yourself compared to other teams in the world working in these areas? Are we at the leading edge? And here we are totally global. So uh, basically in research, the, the research is the most global part of our activities. So if you have a team, wherever it is, you are competing against a world, another team somewhere else in the world. Doesn't matter if they are in, uh, in uh, San Francisco or in Siberia or basically you need to be on the, at the leaning edge and at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the best in the therapy areas where you are working. Because it's an, not only a race on time, so you, you cannot, in our field, you cannot come up with a product equivalent to a previous product five years later. You, you, will, not, you will fail. So you need, to be, you need to arrive with the best innovation, either first or not too late. And that's a big challenge. That's a big challenge. So that's why we have decided to focus on uh, these uh, therapy areas. When we do that, we, we are also mindful about the competitive environment of each therapy area, the size, the growth dynamic. I mean, we did a full strategic exercise to select these uh, therapy areas, but it's, it's, it's very important. And in the, in the coming years, we will be more and more focusing Takeda on these therapy areas. And we accept to do external agreement, and that's a, another change that is happening in the pharmaceutical industry, is the, the paradigm of everything is discovered internally and then commercialized is over. The paradigm is you need to, to collaborate, you need to partner with whoever in order to, to, to produce the next new molecules. It doesn't matter if it's discovered internally or externally, frankly. Especially in, in, our, uh, in our field where it takes about 10 to 15 years to come up with a new product. So if you partner 10 years before the launch, you still have 10 years of work with your partner to, uh, to get there. So there is, it's a real change of, of mindset that we are, we, are, we, we are doing at the moment in order to win in these therapy areas. And then the last element of our, of, of our overall strategy is actually more about uh, how do we manage our business? How disciplined are we financially? Uh, we know that we need to increase our profitability at Takeda. We are very clear on that. And so it's all about execution. It's about cost discipline. It's about efficiency. So that's something also that we are, we are putting a lot of uh, emphasis. Uh, and that's where you can, you can gain economy of scale as well. So uh, if you procure well, you can save money. Uh, so the ability to uh, invest where you want, but to pay for the right price and to manage your cost is very important in any industry, but it's very important for, uh, for Takeda. So that's, um, that's how we uh, have set up this, uh, our overall strategy. 
And that's progress. That's basically what, on with what we are focusing on. And this is what is uh, driving um, uh, all our attention at the moment. And we are very exciting. Uh, we are very excited about the, about the future. We believe that uh, we have this capability to be one of the, of the top one of the top players in the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical market is is is, is getting very concentrated. So you, you need to really be on the move in order to uh, position uh, uh, yourself. But more importantly, what uh, is the most exciting for us is that if we are successful, it means that we will bring a lot of new treatment and new vaccines to the patient. And you know, one thing that we do now at Takeda, and that's part also of the change and the cultural change that we are doing, is that for during all our key meetings, we meet patients. And uh, we do a global leadership uh, conference every year. We have session and dialogue with patients, real patients. They come, they come on stage, we discuss with them. And these are patients that are either using some of our medicine now, which is commercialized, or patients which are treated by medicine in development. So they are part of our clinical trials, and they are helping us to develop our new medicine. And when you do that, it changes completely the sort of uh, feeling and emotion that uh, you have. And uh, it reminds us why we are there. So, and that's, that's for us very important. And you know, there is no more, it's, there is no more uh, satisfying event than the one that we had last week. We got this product uh, uh, approved in Laro. It was a priority review by the FDA, meaning that it's a very important product for the patient. And that has been, this approval has been the result of 20 years of work in the company. For 20 years, Takeda's employees have worked on this product. And eventually, one day, you get the approval. And you are able to launch. And, uh, and that's an amazing feeling. And this is one of the frustrations, actually, in our job and in our industry, is that it doesn't happen often enough. And so when, if you join the industry, or if you, if you are in the industry, you don't have so many events like that, unfortunately. But this is basically what, why we are working, why we are motivated and, and why we are so uh, excited about the future, is to be able to have this type of impact uh, and, and, and positive impact on the society. So um, it's a very exciting time. It's also an exciting time, and I will talk a little bit about that, culturally in the company. Because it's, uh, it's, there are a lot of change. Um, the multicultural change as well. As you have seen, I am not Japanese, but I'm leading a Japanese company. And the question is, how do you, uh, how do you make this change without breaking the, the DNA and the culture of the company? But in fact, instead of that, building on it, building on its foundation, on its strength, and really carrying it and driving it for, for the future. And that's also a very, uh, very exciting and uh, a human experience, if you like. If you take Takeda, we are about 33,000 employees in the company. Um, more than two thirds of these employees are outside of Japan. So it's a very global company. We are present in more than 70 countries. But yet, what is the common foundation for us? That's our values. And that's, also, that's the focus I was explaining earlier, patient trust reputation business. Everybody vibrate and echo to that. But we are also experiencing different, different cultural adjustment and change. Very, I mean, little things. How we do budget review? How do we do uh, meetings? What is uh, spoken language in the company? And that this is, this, how do you make sure, when you have a meeting with 10 nationalities, how do you make sure that everybody contributes? Because you will have some nationalities, they always speak, and some other nationalities, they never speak. You need to know that, and you need to address that proactively. And that's where, actually, multicultural experience helps a lot. Because you know very well and you, you can adjust to that. And diversity is a key strategy for us. 
it's part of our people and talent uh, strategy. How do we make sure that we have the most diverse company uh, in order to be successful? And we are taking it very seriously, and it's not easy. It's not easy. And in Japan, it's more difficult than elsewhere. But we are very committed to it. We believe it's, it's critical to our success. And why it is critical? Because, our, and, and I'm, I'm back to the scientific mind here, there, is, there are a lot of publication, <laughs> there are a lot of paper, there are a lot of demonstration on the fact that diversity translates to creativity. The more diverse, the more creative. The more creative, the more chance we have to discover the new set of molecules and the next new product. And we are in the business of innovation and creativity. And that's why the diversity is, is absolutely critical for us in the future. And that's why it's a, it's a key priority. So culturally, it's a fascinating time for us, very exciting. And uh, we, it's, it's also part of the transformation that we are conducting at Takeda. I think, I don't know how long I spoke, but I think I'll stop there and uh, we'll be very happy to uh, answer to your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. Thank I you. truly enjoyed uh, your speech and it was very concise and to the point. And I have no more things to ask. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, first of all, I'd like to ask, I'd like to ask you like, three or four dimensions. One is about culture, one is about leadership, one is about strategy, and so forth. First of all, I'd like to ask you that you have done four months meeting people after you became CEO. And you found out about the culture and DNA. What was your assessment of the strength of Takeda vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Glasso? Well, I think the um, Takeda values um, and, and, um, and historically Takeda had defined very clear, a uh, very clear set of values, which are, which are integrity, fairness, honesty, and perseverance. The origin are, are they have very long origins. Uh, actually, these four words are uh, uh, not perfect translation of actually uh, values expressed in, uh, in, in Japanese, I think. But in Takeda, people uh, take it much more seriously. Many companies in the world have a set of values, but in fact, when you look at the way they act, uh, they don't necessarily uh, align to the values. Now, I think that's a big strength, especially in our sector. And unfortunately, our sector reputation is not very good, or it could, could be better. Uh, for different reasons, mistakes made. Um, also, we are dealing with health is not e an easy, because I think that's, and that's something very important to, to understand is that we, uh, we, don't, we don't have, we, don't, we are not selling product to consumer, right? Uh, the, nobody wants our product. Uh, the patients are sick, they need a treatment, the physicians tell them, well, this is a treatment you should take. And on top of that, many, all of the treatment, almost all, have a side effect. So, it's, uh, so we are not, so it's not a sort of consumer classical uh, relation. It's a totally different relation. And being value-based company is very important. That was a, a big strength. That is a big strength of, uh, of Takeda. Um, of course, another strength of Takeda is our Japanese presence and our Japanese reputation. And when we say that it's not just being the number one, being, being the biggest pharmaceutical company in Japan, is, is if you ask physicians, doctors in Japan, and you ask them which company is the best company for you in Japan, they will tell you Takeda. That's a big strength. And actually, we used this example to develop what we call now a customer satisfaction index. So it's a physician satisfaction index. And we are, we are starting to measure everywhere in the world in our key countries how physicians are responding to, uh, to that. So being so strong in Japan is a very important strength for, for us to, uh, to win in the future. But as I explained earlier, 
the Japanese market is too small today sure. to just be satisfied by that. Um, so what did you feel that is needed for Takeda to be stronger globally after four months of speaking? What do you have? What do you, what do you think we have to change? So we um, the the strategic clarification I was explaining earlier are very important because. Uh, in, in, uh, in all organizations, but especially in big organizations, the clearer you are about your strategy in a very concise way, the better. So people, they know, you know where to go. And so, for example, we said GI and oncology is very important. That means that everywhere in the world we will have, that means that we will have a full al alignment between our R&D effort, investment, and country organization and commercial, a full alignment, which was not in the past that way. So, uh, and the, the consequence of that in the past is that today we don't have a single global product at Takeda, not a single one. In fact, we are launching the first global product in Takeda because now it's very clear. If we have, a, if we launch, if you introduce a product in oncology like last week, we expect this product to be launched in every country. So there is a strategic clarity that you cannot be a general manager in your country A and say, well, oncology, I'm not interested. It doesn't. Okay. So there is a strategic alignment which is very, uh, very important. You mentioned in, uh, that two thirds of the executive committee members are not Japanese, and you have seven to eight different nationalities, and one third is Japanese, and you conduct your uh, management entirely in English. And do you, have, do you find any difficulties managing Japanese people, like or managing Japanese company? You, you, you were the CEO of a, a large uh, conglomerate, you know, uh, like a pharmaceutical company. And what do you find that it has the difficulties or challenges? So, you know what I realized first is that every uh, person is different. So um, we tend, so every uh, Japanese person is different. Every German person is different, every American. So there, there, is, there are common traits, if you like, but at the end of the day, every person is different. So in my management team, I have four Japanese. They are all very different, very different, because they have different experience, different character. They have lived in different countries. So they, they, are, they, are sort of, they have grown up in a different ways. So that's the first thing is that, in fact, I am, so we tend to say, well, there is the Japanese culture, but. They are, they are, first, company culture are very different within Japan. So there is a Takeda way of doing things. When I discuss with uh, other CEOs in Japan, I realize that they have a totally different culture uh, in, their, in their company compared to Takeda culture in Japan. So every company is different and every person is different. So I think what is important as a leader is to understand everyone as well as possible and make sure that there is good respect for people and a good team dynamic. And some people tend to be, you know, are very engaged and speak a lot. Some others are a bit more reserved, so you need to make them comfortable and speak out. And it's not only like Japanese versus Americans versus, it's every individual. Yeah. And having such a diversity in my team forced us not to think by nationality, but to think by person. So let, let me go on to the second group of discuss, discussion, which is a strategy. Mr. Hasegawa came to uh, Globus and spoke about the need for globalization about four or five years ago. Uh, he has done it in terms of globalizing Takeda and also the management team as well. But in terms of the competition to gigantic other big pharmaceutical companies, the scale is not there yet. So what is your uh, assessment as to how to catch up with them in terms of scale? Is the scale so much important or not? And uh, what is your strategy to compete against big corporations, like big pharmaceutical companies? Well, the, the, um, I would say the scale is you need to have a minimum scale in order to survive today as a research-based pharmaceutical companies. So, um, you know, to, to, uh, to develop and launch a new product costs anywhere between 500 million US dollars and 1 billion for a single product. 
The problem is that we fail all the time, so the overall cost <laughs> of R&D is much higher. And you know, one of the numbers yeah, that you see very often uh, floating in, in, in a newspaper is that on average it costs 1.5 billion for the pharmaceutical industry to come up with one product. Why? This number is true too, but it's the average. So it's a R&D budget divided by the number of new products, including all failures. So if you want to, to stay in the race, you need a critical mass of uh, R&D investment. Um, after, when you have reached this critical mass, it's not necessarily, there is not necessarily a direct link between success and, uh, uh, and failure. Because then you, re you rely on talent and creativity. And you know, the majority of the new product today uh, are coming from startup and biotech, not big pharma. Um, more than 60% of the new product are coming from startup biotech, and then they are either in license or bought by big pharma. So the creativity is happening a lot. And this biotech and startup have small teams, but very, very focused, really on the edge and, and, and uh, successful. So it's not only, then, then it's a question of talent, but you need a minimum critical mass. I think, I think Takeda is just there okay. to stay in the race. Okay. And uh, uh, I remember uh, when Mr. Hasega came, into, uh, came to become CEO of, of Takeda, you know, he, there was a huge pile of cash, and then he used lots of it to acquire like, uh, companies abroad to globalize Takeda. And then you reached a certain critical mass to be able to be successful. And do you think you need to see or find more acquisition in the future to, to keep up with the pace? Or uh, it's too secret that you cannot tell? <laughs> no, 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 sure. So, <laughs> yes, um, as I was saying, uh, made a, 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 a two big acquisition. And this acquisition define, define uh, what Takeda is today. I mean, uh, with one acquisition, we got access in the emerging market. And one acquisition doubled the number of employees of Takeda. It was a very defining moment. So in one acquisition, the company doubled in size its number of employees. And the company, which was present in about 25 countries, became present in 70 countries. It's like, and we are still, to be honest, we are still digesting that. And one of the reasons I was asked to come is also to, to finish this digestion, if you like, of this acquisition. But there are defining moments, and it allows Takeda to play on a global stage, and as I explained earlier, it's so important for, for our future. But to come back to your questions, yes, I think you, you cannot succeed today anymore if you don't do acquisition and m and if you are not um, agile. It's impossible. Because if you rely, it will be a mistake to rely only on your internal discovery uh, teams. You know, for for one researcher in one field of Takeda, you have about 100,000 other researchers outside in the world. And not in pharmaceutical companies, in academia, in startup, in biotech. So it will be very arrogant to say, well, I have the, the one. You, the 100,000 are bad, and I, we always have the one who will win. It will, doesn't happen like that. So you need to be really uh, you know, on the look and be, uh, be prepared to do some acquisition in the therapy area that you have selected. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me go to the third uh, question, uh, which is uh, leadership. And you became a CEO of Takeda, and, uh, which is uh, the largest of the pharmaceutical company in Japan. And uh, how, what was your uh, best uh, things that you have done uh, to be reaching that high? Because there are quite a few people here who ascribe to become CEO of big corporation. What kind of advice you would give that worked well for you? Yeah, I always get these questions. I am always, uh, so first of all, <laughs> I think uh, there are many different ways of, uh, of potentially uh, succeed. I mean, succeed, I mean, what is success first of all? I, <laughs> and so uh, I never, it, I never imagined that I would become CEO until very lately. So uh, that's not something, 15 years ago, you will ask me, would you become CEO? I said, what are you talking about? I mean, so I was just focusing on doing my job well and, you know, be very uh, dedicated and curious. And um, 
So I, I think that's the first thing. Uh, and I'm very, when I meet very young people, they tell me, sometimes they tell me, well, I, I want your job. I'm always a little bit, oh, you, how old are you? And so I think everyone has its own uh, rhythm. And that I, I fully respect. But I have very simple um, leadership uh, principle, I guess. So first is uh, to, to engage with, uh, with your team and uh, to be close to your team. And I think it's, it seems obvious, but it's not. It's not because many managers, in fact, don't really dialogue with their team. They don't take the time. And I think the, the, the technology of today are, in fact, detrimental to that. Because how many communication do you do by mail instead of just going there and have a chat and discussing? And personally, I, I think it's much more powerful to have interaction than just dropping a mail. Or, uh, and I think um, I'm very uh, so engaging and inspiring and supporting. That's very important. I am a deep believer of climate and you know if there is a good ambience in the team it makes a whole difference if people are happy to come because there is a, you know you know good constructive ambience uh, it's it's for me it's very important so you can contribute to that and that's leadership as well then of course as part of leadership is where do you want to go clarity and you will, I mean you will be surprised you think you have creative clarity but if you really ask well, it's not not so clear for people and so I think that's, that's also an important part of uh, leadership. Crystal clarity on the direction, the objectives, where do we want to go, and how do you get the team to contribute to, uh, to that. I think that's a very important uh, element of, uh, of leadership. So I don't have big lessons about leadership, but it's very much pragmatic. And uh, you know, respect for people is another thing and uh, making sure that everybody can, uh, can contribute. Performance is important too. Telling, telling people when it's good, when it's bad, and doing something about it, that's also very important. Many uh, leaders or managers don't do that so well. Um, you know, positive, and we will say positive feedback, negative, but how do we do that? I'm st it's still an area I'm, I'm self-learning. And that's perhaps the last point I will mention is that this is a journey and you learn all the time. And I think you stop progressing and evolving the day you believe that you have nothing to learn anymore. You mentioned that you lived in nine countries. Like, which countries have you lived? Like, uh, for instance? Australia. I started my career as a, actually sales representatives mm -hmm. in Australia, Australia, for example. Yeah. And then I went to the US, to Germany, to Switzerland, to UK, to Singapore, Singapore. to France. France to uh, Japan, how much, uh, and UK. Oh, UK, yeah. okay. <laughs> and it seems like uh, um, looking at Japanese corporations, whenever we have uh, uh, non-Japanese CEOs, French seem to be successful. Is there a reason why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like Carlos Ghosn. <laughs> no, I'm not sure, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure if you... Uh, I'm not sure you can say that French are, seems to be very successful as well. <laughs> uh, no, but I think um, I think it's more. Uh, I, I think the key is uh, to be able to uh, interact with different culture. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, uh, both you and Carlos Ghosn has a very strong global experiences. Yeah. And then uh, uh, both of you seem to understand uh, cultural differences and sensitivity as well. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, in business, we are taught that the customer is very important. In your business, you have a patient who is prescribed a medicine by a medical practitioner, and you get a reimbursement if you're a reimbursed country from a regulatory <laughs> regime. And then on top of that, you have people like FDA that you have to deal with. Who is your customer? How do you define that in together? Because the patient actually doesn't pay. Depends which country, yeah? Uh, no, let's talk about the yeah, reimbursed yeah, sure, sure, uh, sure. world. Well, thank you for the question. And in fact, every time the I, see, I see a team trying to answer these questions, I stop them now and say, look, 
Don't try to find out with our customers. Just satisfy everybody. <laughs> <All right. laughs> because the reality is that we don't have a single customer. So we, have, we have the physicians, the pharmacists, the government, the payers, the, the patient. They are, they are all our customers. And what we learn in the pharmaceutical industry is if you don't work well with this, what I call this ecosystem, you fail. You can have a great strategy, but if you miss one element of the ecosystem, you might fail. And even it's more sophisticated than that. Within the physicians, we have the general practitioner, the specialist. The specialist has an influence on the general practitioner. It's a very complex ecosystem that you need to master. So don't even try to, to answer the questions. They all have a role to play. We need to satisfy them. Yes. And, and depending on the countries, you, you can interact differently. It's very local. OK. So the gentleman at the back. Uh, Mr. Weber, thank you very much for an intriguing speech, even for those of us not in the industry. Um, you spoke about launching the first medicine globally. And uh, that you also have to be able to respond locally to uh, patient flow, et cetera, in 80 different countries. Um, in order to do that now and, and to grow in the future, is there a focus on hiring um, either MBA or, or non-MBA uh, people from overseas or people that have that language ability or network in those emerging markets, et cetera? Uh, so, so, you know, 90, uh, I don't know, 95 percent of our employees are local. Uh, so, so, meaning that they, they interact with a local environment, and they don't interact with multi uh, uh, multinationalities uh, within within the companies. So, I think so. I, we give a lot of freedom to our local operating companies to our local organization to do what, what they have to do to have the best possible talent. And in fact, uh, we, the only thing we ask them is have a talent strategy. <laughs> so you need to be, and we have one goal, which is ambitious, but we believe we can, uh, we can, we can get there, is we want to be the best company in the pharmaceutical sector. We want to be the best company to work for. So we want, if someone wants to work in the pharmaceutical industry, he says, well, Dakeda, they are the one. I can, I can blossom, I, I, I will be happy, I have some freedoms, I am empowered, etc." So I think it's a, it's a local strategy first. And at the end of the day, it's the likelihood, you, I mean, the likelihood that you start your career with a local job is very high. It's only when you grow up in the company or with seniority that you end up being, being, uh, being global. So you can build it up. Now, in terms of profile, we are looking at a very wide range of uh, profile, from the super scientist to uh, the MBA. Uh, but what is very clear also is that in a global company like us, if you, if you don't have a global profile, at one stage, you will be blocked. You cannot be in my team if you don't speak English. It's impossible. And it's very likely in the future that you cannot be below my team if you don't speak English either. So the top 300 people of the company, they will have to be fluent in English. It's, it, that's, that's what a global company is as well. And it's not only about English speaking. It's also about multicultural interpersonal relationship. Okay, so there are three hands up already. One, two, and three. So could you please give one, one on the other, six or seven. Let's go on to the gentleman in the back and also a gentleman in front, and also a lady right here in the, in the front. Hi, Mr. Weber. Uh, I've been following the Takeda, I've been following the Takeda story for quite some time right now, over the past five years, and I've watched how the company has morphed itself, has transformed and transitioned itself from a typical Japanese company to a global um, dominant powerhouse in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, one of the things that I do want to commend the company is that I noticed that the company um, separate and segregate yourselves from your competitors in the industry. One of the key things that I've noticed that Takeda has, has, has done a lot, in addition to the acquisitions that you made, um, as you know, in this industry, 
in the pharmaceutical industry, um, it's, 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 a very, it's a very closed market in Japan. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the old traditional Japanese pharmaceutical companies don't focus too much on, on research and development. They focus, and they don't focus on open innovation. And this is one of the key areas that I see that Takeda, is, well, one of the key reasons why Takeda has, has transitioned itself and been a, a major success story globally, okay? Um, and I do want to commend the company for that because I've been following this for about quite some time. Um, as you know, globally, not just in Japan, but global pharmaceutical companies are struggling right now. And one of the reasons why they're focusing, in the, and, and as you know, that regular patents on, on drugs expire after like a nine to 10 year period, and then they become generic. Um, the way that most Jap the, the way that most companies take advantage of that is that they focus on open innovation, reinventing new business models, new business models, and can continue to focus on research and development R and D. Um, I would like to ask the question: How does Takeda see itself's position from an innovative company, where where you focus on an innovative culture, okay, um, for diversity, which you which, which you just mentioned? And then you just spoke upon, um, to the gentleman over there, you talked about the end user customer is also your customer as well. So it's not just the customer experience, it's the patient experience. And the question that I want to ask you is that where do you see Takeda leapfrogging itself over the next five years, next five to ten mm -hmm. years, as you okay. continue to focus on open innovation and, and, and more open business models? Okay. Yeah, well, I think I'll give you one example. Uh, you know what? In R&D, it's, uh, I mean, the, the most difficult decision we have to make uh, in the company, I mean, there are many difficult decisions, but one of the most difficult decisions is which R&D project you invest on and which, uh, which R&D project you drop or you don't go. I mean, that's, that's very difficult because you need to predict 15 years in advance uh, if, will the product work, et cetera, et cetera. So the way you respond to that is that you, you have sort of what we call uh, pipeline strategy, so you say uh, very risky bets, less risky, and then therapy area focus, non therapy area focus. One of the area that we are uh, focusing on, and I'm very pleased that we were able to do that, is in um, uh, regenerative medicine, pre protent stem cells, and the partnership we did with Professor Yamanaka in Japan. And that's, that's for me, that's the illustration of the new Takeda. We were able to do this 10-year agreement with Professor Yamanaka in a record time, in a, total, in a very innovative setup, and that could lead to the leapfrog innovation in the field of regenerative medicine and drug discovery in the next 10 years. And that's, that's very exciting, and that's also a demonstration that there is good science in Japan. Very good, yes. It's on now? Yeah. Oh, good evening. Thank you very much for your talk. My name is Aya, and uh, I have been uh, in a related industry, shall I say. And uh, I'm glad to hear that you've been, you are involving patient to your meeting. I, I believe it would be an advisory board meeting, in, whether in a clinical or uh, health technology assessment type of meeting. And have you ever had a chance to uh, sort of redirect or adjust your R&D direction because of you hear from patient? Or if you ever hear any uh, significant input from patient voice, will you be able to, are you willing to change the course of uh, R&D direction? Well, I, I think it's, uh, the, uh, the patient have to uh, uh, penetrate the mind of the researcher. If you don't create that, you can, have a, you can be a researcher in Takeda and industry having, what, 25 years, 30 years in, in the R&D without having met a single time a patient. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a lost opportunity to understand better what is their problems, how do they feel, uh, what, uh, what, are, uh, how, what is important for them when they have this disease. So uh, we are not only meeting patients during advisory board or... Um, when I have my global leadership meeting with 300 people, we have a large, every day we have a session with a patient. 
and we talk about the specific disease and what they experience. It's just, uh, and that's, that's, that's very important, but also there is a special uh, pride also of helping these people. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Greg Story. When Prime Minister Abe was in Silicon Valley earlier this year, he made the comment that Japanese innovation is being held back by a cultural preference for very few or no mistakes. And he noticed that in America, uh, mistakes are seen as part of the growth trend, the growth journey, and failure is not seen as fatal. And he was ruminating that in Japan, failure can be fatal. So how do you deal with mistakes in your company? Because the bets that you are placing, the costs that you were talking about before in terms of developing products are massive. So it's a very big and expensive mistake if it doesn't work. And that sets a cultural theme throughout the whole company when the size is so big. How do you develop the strength of people to deal with mistakes, be prepared to make mistakes as part of the journey to get to innovation and creativity? Yeah. It's a good. Uh, it's a good question. I, I think that. So, first thing is that I agree, I agree with you that we need to uh, allow mistakes and uh, errors as long as we learn from it. And um, this is not. A, it seems simple like that. Uh, yes, but it's not so simple because in our industry, a mistake can have very grave consequences. It's a shortcut to say, well, mistakes, no worries. Uh, we'll, you know, uh, there will be no consequences. There is. So I think for us, it's always a very uh, tense uh, situation. But I think that it's very important to uh, have a culture of try, fail, succeed. If you, if you fail this time, you will succeed next time. So especially in the research area, I think we need to let go of the innovation uh, like that. Um, I actually think that um, this is not the biggest issue uh, in, in, in Japan, personally. From, from what I have seen in Takeda, because again, I'm not, I'm not sure it's in Japan, but in, in Takeda, there is a very strong uh, acceptance of mistakes. So people don't hide, uh, for example, because they know that it will be, uh, uh, it will be a sort of, we don't get ballistic, and uh, we accept that. It's very important as well. So, but for me, the key, the, the biggest source of creativity is diversity. And I think there is not enough, enough, there is not enough diversity in our Japanese organization to be at the maximum of creativity. If I, if I will act on one area, it would be on this one. And it could be gender diversity, it could be global diversity, international diversity. Uh, but I think this is the biggest uh, challenge for uh, Japan. You look at Silicon Valley, I mean, they are like, in any team, there are like 15 nationalities, and it's, 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 I think diversity is key for creativity. Okay, so who else? There are one on the back, and uh, let's go for, uh, there's one lady, and the one gentleman over here and on the back. Okay, you can start. Thank you very much for your great talk. Um, my question is, how did you get good reputation when you start you know, the new job in Takeda uh, from the employees? Because I will start you know, my new job from December, from this December, so um, I will be planning to, my, uh, to finish my six years in engineering task now. So, if you have any advice to me, I, I'd like to ask you, yeah, the advice. Can you understand what I mean? So it's advice to when you start a new job? You know, just how can, yeah, 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 but, yes, but, you know, how can I say, um, how did you get good reputation from, you know, Takeda's employees? Um, well, you know, uh, you I, I think, um, okay, the reputation will follow you, so you cannot do anything about it. You have the reputation you have. But what is important, I, my advice when you start a new job, is that um, spend time to, uh, to meet with people. 
somehow, somehow the, we got, uh, we got uh, thrown into a new job and we are, you have straight away a lot of mail tasks and you miss the first moment, which is very important, to, um, to uh, meet people, understand the culture. It's a unique moment because you have fresh eyes and you see the things differently. But it is missed often because we are under pressure. So right now, at the moment, actually, I recruited a few people in my team. And now I organize transition time, very significant transition time. And I told people, look, during four months, you don't do anything. You just meet people. And because otherwise, if you don't do that at the beginning, you will never do it. And you will never understand fully the, uh, the team and uh, where people are. And um, I think that that would be my, uh, my advice. I think also if it's uh, complicated, um, you need to plan your onboarding. I spend, I spend, I, I had a sort of uh, uh, three, I had four months, uh, three months garden leave. I spent the entire three months planning my onboarding. My first six months in the company were planned day by day, hour by hour. Every hour was planned for the first uh, six months. Because if you don't do that, you just get dragged into uh, things which are, in fact, not very important, and then it's over. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you for your great talk. And I'm a researcher in a pharmaceutical company. So innovation is a key step I, I truly understand. And everybody said, said to me, uh, innovation is a key successful factor. But uh, yeah, I know that, but how? That is a quite uh, important issue. So, and I think that, uh, in terms of that, you said uh, you, you form two or three teams in the same research field, and that kind of internal competition, probably? Uh, no, 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 not internal competition. Uh, so we have uh, some, in the focus area we identify, like for example, oncology, we have some teams in the US, in Japan, and they work on different projects. We don't have internal competition. Ah, I see, I see. External is enough. OK. <laughs> okay. So then my, my question is, uh, how do you share the uh, knowledge, uh, the overseas knowledge, especially for, uh, yeah, for, related to the former question, uh, especially for the failure experience, how do you share timely? You travel, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think. Uh, you know, I think, uh, so yeah, let's say we take our, our oncology team. So we have a take it down, we have a big oncology research team in, uh, in Boston. And then we have a big oncology research team. They are part of the same team in uh, Shonan in Japan. And we have a smaller uh, part of the team in San Diego in California. So they are spread across three locations. Well, they have to find a way to collaborate among each other. And uh, they can travel, they can do video conference, they can do what they want, uh, I don't mind. But I think we shouldn't miss opportunity to collaborate. And that's a big challenge, actually. Uh, one of the biggest challenge for us, a global company, is frankly to manage time zone. So my team is spread over uh, Tokyo, and Osaka, and Zurich, and Singapore, and Boston, and Chicago. <sighs> How do, I mean, it's very complicated to organize ourselves. But I think every team has to find a way to collaborate efficiently. It's not. You know, it's not my job to find out the way they, they find it. I mean, you know. often I am asked also, how do you innovate? I say, well, I recruit the best talent, and then they sort it out. <laughs> OK, so the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much for a great talk. I wanted to ask you, you've mentioned diversity many times, but I'm very curious as to, to understand as to what exactly you are doing to promote diversity within your organization in terms of strategies. because. You are in one of the least diverse countries, or at least so they think of themselves in the world. And you do have a growing team of uh, foreign people within your leadership team. Um, how do you enhance the communications? How do you enhance the speed at which that your team actually thinks in a diverse way? It doesn't just understand there's a concept of diversity, actually accepts the diversity and works with it. Yeah. Well, it's not easy. It's a great uh, question. It's not uh, a Japanese topic only. It's uh, all, uh, all type of companies. I think, how do we do that? First, 
First, we, we clearly uh, express diversity as a must for the success of the company. And so it's not, it's not just the last, latest fashion, a fashion uh, world or trend, and you know, it looks good to be a diverse company. We strongly, we believe that it is vital for our success and, and, and we share a lot of information about that internally. And that's, that's for me, convict, you know, it's good to tell something to people, but to convince them it's another, uh, <laughs> and leadership, good leadership is to convince people, not just to tell them. And, so, and so that's very important regarding diversity. Because what I realized is that many people didn't really understand why diversity is so important. Well, it worked well so far, so why suddenly you are pushing so much? Well, then you link into creativity, and then you link into other dimension, and I think you can certainly, in the mind of people, you know, mark some points there. After that, it's making sure that the way you work is in favor of diversity. So if, if your life's working style in the company is against diversity, that's a big problem. Um, uh, after that, the globalization is a way in is helping diversity because we are now creating created global teams and they have to work together. Uh, it's not, so the oncology team is not Japan team, is the oncology team. And then you have Japanese, you have Americans, you have whatever. And they, they have to work together. And they will learn progressively how to work together. But it's, it's a journey. Okay, so let's go for three more questions. Like, uh, okay, one, two, uh, I think, uh, there are three over there. So one, one lady right here, and uh, one gentleman on the back, the white shirt, and one over here. Uh, Mr. Weaver, thank you for your speech today. I really enjoyed your speech. Um, for being a global company in the ph pharmaceutical industry, I understand that um, you are t t t telling us that um, a certain amount of scalability and also the creativity will be the key. However, um, from my perspective, um, Japanese pharmaceutical companies are not uh, are really creativity even from the past. But um, in these 20 years, you have told us that um, we have been losing share in the world from 20% to 8%. Um, indeed, we are not really um, large enough to have the scale, uh, to enjoy scalability. But is scalability the only issue that uh, we Japanese pharmaceutical companies are facing um, to be global? I think there may be two or three more points which you have in mind. If you can share that, I would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, to come back first to your first, uh, the point you mentioned, the 20% uh, the was more the anomaly than the eight. Because what, I mean, the Japanese population is less than 8% of the global population. So eventually, at the end of the day, our business is correlated to patient and to population. Whether you like it or not, that's, that's a long, long term trend. But to come, to come to your question, I think the, um, there are a few, um, so to, in, in, in global markets like uh, pharmaceutical, you need to, be, to have a global mindset as a company to succeed. And, but many Japanese companies are getting more and more global. And being global means that you, you, uh, you are present where it matters in order to be successful. And uh, I was very, um, uh, I didn't discuss with the CEO of Toyota but, uh, recently, but I saw that, for example, they decided to open the new R&D center for self-driving car in Silicon Valley. No, why not in Japan? Well, because they probably assess that they have a better chance of succeeding there. So I think there is a, a dimension of you want to be strategic, but you want to do the right thing for the success, wherever it is. And that's something that is important as a mindset. Uh, you respect your foundation, you respect your culture, but you don't, you don't, you, you, you do the right thing for the success uh, in the future. Specific to our sectors, I think there are a few things that could be improved in Japan. It's a, when you look at the academic research level, it's very high in Japan. 
uh, I think the level of education is very high. Actually, many, uh, many uh, new innovation have been discovered in Japan. So for, I give you an example. One of the most innovative new, new product, uh, unfortunately, it's not a Takeda product, other, other companies, it's a new uh, immuno-oncology drugs. It's called PD-1 inhibitors. I mean, this is uh, the revolution in cancer. It's dominated by American companies. Discovered where? In Japan. Mm, so discovered in Japan. The PD-1 inhibitor discovered in Japan. But Japan is missing one in the, in the value chain and the ecosystem. There is one thing missing in Japan. is startup from academia and VCs. This is what is missing. So you get a, a great academic research. They discover PD-1 to bring it to the next step. Nobody. This is in US, startup in US, and then the startup sell to big farmers in US. I think this is a big part of the missing chain in Japan. Okay, so one more. It's over there, yes. And one more. Um, hello again. Uh, this is Takuma Maeda. I'm uh, head of MS Consult Group. Um, it's kind of related to this lady's question. And in nine, 2009, Takeda was like the 11th largest pharmaceutical company in the world in terms of the sales size. And in 2014, the Takeda is the 18th largest pharmaceutical company. And actually, uh, after the acquisition of Nycomed, Millennium, the you know, scale became bigger. However, like, just like the acquisition of, you know, between Allegan and Pfizer, the other pharmaceutical companies are you know, creating more scales. And looking at this kind of situation, and I believe that Japanese pharmaceutical companies are less successful in terms of expanding you know, geography, uh, you know, making geographic footprints. And I also understand that you used to be responsible for the emerging markets in GSK. And as compared with you know, GSK or other multinational companies, you know, what is actually fundamentally causing Japanese companies to be less successful, to be globalized? Um, well, it's, uh, if, I, if I knew, I would be, uh, you know. But um, the, uh, well, first of all, there has been an economic crisis going on in Japan for the last 20 years, so that has an impact. Uh, uh, it has an impact on the, on, on the, on the, on the companies. I think, uh, in our sector, um, you, you are right. I mean, 10 years ago, company, Takeda was in market capitalization. Takeda was uh, the number uh, 15th. Today, we are 30th in market capitalization. But the, the, the level to be 15th, as you need to be three times bigger now in order, in order to be 50th, um, 15th, uh, number 15 compared to 10 years ago. So it's been a huge development. I think, I think the, uh, the, the speed of globalization has probably taken by surprise a few companies. The, 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 the growth in emerging markets has been, I mean, en enormous. So, you know, the, the, in our sector, the Chinese, China market is the second biggest after the United States. And only companies who did the move in China 10 years ago are, are, are big enough. I think it took longer for a Japanese company to understand that this emerging market trend is enormous. And uh, it's difficult to catch up because, of course, the market is becoming more competitive after a while, and it's more difficult to enter if you are late. I think that's a big reason behind the, uh, uh, the size. The other potential big reason, but frankly, I'm not sure about that, but that's one of my thinking is that in the 80s, um, I will, the 80s might be the years of manufacturing excellence. So you have the best you know, manufacturing uh, process, quality <coughs> chain, supply chain, etc. I think the 90s, the year 2000, are the year of uh, pure creativity and innovation. And I think this has, a big, it has been a huge shift. And I think Japan has, has been slow to, uh, to see that. 
and it requires different skills and capability. And it's, it's, uh, it's also less, uh, it's more global as well. So anyone can disrupt your, your business model, if you like, anywhere in the world. And in many sectors, in a way, pharma is not too, too uh, we are still a brick and mortar sectors. We have not been so much uh, challenged by uh, you know, the, the internet side of the world. That will come. But we are, we are still a quite traditional brick and mortar sectors. But still, <coughs> the level of technology and innovation now is, is, is enormous. And I, I think that you need to really see that and go in very quickly. So there are multiple uh, factors um, which uh, explain, uh, explain that. But it's not too late. Not too late. Watch the space. Um, we'll be back in this type of ranking in a few years. That's my job anyway. Okay, last question over there. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask you one question. How can IT tool support pharmaceutical companies' innovation? Uh, I, I saw the news there is a tip on the tablet during clinical trial in the US, uh, FDA has approved, and or by using such kind of tips, or if we look at ja Japanese uh, metrips number, so maybe we can reduce the number of metrip in Japan by using a new technology or SFA. So are there any technology you're looking for to help uh, pharmaceuticals innovation? That's my question. I'm not sure I, I capture all the questions, but this is about new technology to, yeah, IT to, tool. to help the how, patient. How, or? Yeah, how can IT tool uh, yeah. help? Well, I, I can share with you that uh, a few uh, weeks ago, I, I spent a week in, uh, in uh, the Silicon Valley to meet all the high tech companies working in the domain of healthcare. And I came back convinced that they will revolutionize the way patients are treated. Uh, and the technology is ready to be used uh, soon. I mean, it's like within, within certainly my lifetime and, and, and my, my career. So this, the technology which will be available for monitoring patient health will change completely the pharmaceutical industry. Not only the way clinical trials are done, but also the way patients are treated. It will be an enormous. And that's, again, the question is, OK, who is developing that? Not Japanese companies. Which is amazing, because when you think about it, in the 80s, Japan was a champion of miniaturization and small stuff. But now this nanotechnology, this, these devices that are developed, they are, they are nanotechnology. And in, in five to 10 years, we will be, we'll have everywhere <laughs> wearables, whether we like it or not. And our health status will be monitored on real life. And that's ready now. It will change completely the pharmaceutical industry. And so that's something we need to move in as a company now in order to be on the edge. Okay, let, let me ask you one question and we'd like to close. Um, one question is about uh, the ch Japanese regulations, like uh, in pharmaceutical company and pharmaceutical industries. I'm quite engaged in uh, what we call G1 Summit, which Hasegawa-san and Hirate-san always attend. And uh, are we are uh, in a position to advise the Japanese government as to what to do to enhance technology and also enhance commercialization of technology. What would you advise to the Japanese government or Pri Prime Minister Abe? in order to make Japanese pharmaceutical industries to be stronger? Well, so one, one first comment I will make is that I, I am very impressed by the uh, change that are, the level of change that is occurring in Japan at the moment. I mean, it's, it's amazing um, how much change there is in Japan. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to uh, watch as well because on one side, you see so many changes in, in the economy, in the society, in the regulation, but also some, some uh, also traditions which are very strong in Japan, and you see the two uh, like that. 
But the level of change right now in Japan is, is strong, much stronger than many European countries, for example, which I think is very important, but I am very optimistic about Japan because of that. In the, re regarding regulation, in the pharmaceutical industry, there has been enormous project, uh, pro um, um, improvement in the last few years. To re register a new product, it's much faster. So in Japan, you used to have anywhere between five, uh, we used to have five to seven years delay between introduction of a new drug in the US and in Japan. It was like nobody so much knew it, but that was the reality. I think it's disappearing, it's really shrinking and you get much faster access, and that's because of the regulatory chain. That has been very impressive. Japan also has, has a, developed a special path for regenerative medicine, the type of medicine we want to develop with uh, Professor Yamanaka. There is a special path for that which has been developed by Japan. So Japan is really making the right step to uh, speed up the regulation. If for our sector, if there is one area I will focus in terms of regulation, it will be on what I was describing earlier, academy, spin-off, startup biotech VCs. It's still very complicated to, uh, to, to, uh, to my knowledge, it's still very complicated to, uh, to do that in a very easy way, no IP issue. Um, uh, and that's, that's what the US have understood very well. If you are a professor in a university, you are paid by the public, you can, you discover something, the IP is owned by the university, you can create a startup biotech tomorrow to leverage this discovery, it will be done like that automatically. It's still very difficult to do uh, in Europe and in Japan. Why is that? Because, the, why is it? because there aren't enough uh, entrepreneurial companies around, or is it because of which big pharmaceutical companies uh, are not capable? It's more fundamental than that. You need to look at the status. So if you are a paid professor at university, you cannot be CEO of a startup at the same time. And then you cannot transfer your discovery easily in terms of patent. And so it's quite complicated. It's not seamless, if you like. And then you are missing the VCs. So it's more because of mentality of professors and the uh, uh, bureaucratic organization of universities, right. and maybe there's lack of VC capital. I, I will look at that. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. more entrepreneurial. Yeah. So we should do a lot more good job because the government is uh, deregulating and changing Japan fast enough. So I think Japanese companies should take advantage and should convince professors and universities to move forward. And so please join us to say thank you to Christoph for giving us chances to thank learn you very much a lot for your question. Thank about you. Takeda. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, this will conclude the speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.